Hello, and it is Talk Money Week. Talk Money Week is the 6th to the 10th of November. And every year, people are encouraged by the Money and Pension Service to talk about money. Now, if you know the uh, Office for the Small Business Commissioner, you'll know that we talk about money all the time. We talk about payments. We talk about getting your invoices paid. So today, we're going to talk about talking rather than about money. And I'm joined by Eric Dixon, who's a communications coach and a broadcaster. He's also a voiceover artist. And Eric and I first met on BBC Five Live when Eric got four hours to talk every night and I only got 15 minutes to talk every day. (laughs) Eric, (laughs) I wonder why it was that you got so much more time to talk than I did. I think you're good at editing as you go, Liz, that's why. And they probably had to give me a bit more time of waffle, but that will be what it is. But lovely to see you again after all these years. And Eric, why do you think it is that we are so reticent to talk about money? Do you know, I think we probably all are a bit. I don't know if it's uniquely British, but it might be. But maybe we've been brought up where it was a bit taboo to talk about money or it's a bit embarrassing, socially unacceptable or whatever. But of course, this is business. So money inevitably is part of the mix. And there's a survey I saw oh, some while back where I think it was 2000 British adults and they discovered that a quarter of them would rather talk about mental health or infertility than talk about money. So I think there is a a problem there, but what we mustn't do is let people who owe us money, however upset, frustrated, angry we are about it, we mustn't let them use that natural reticence on our part to prevent us sort of standing up for ourselves. But you know, there, there are figures that show that in any given year, something like 15% of invoices go unpaid because we You're don't right. chase them up. You're right. And, and if these people who try to chase and fail, I wonder, or people who just accept that maybe it's not worth the trouble. Now, if it's a small amount of money, maybe you're prepared to let that go if you really believe that the problem is too great. But most of the time, the people who should be embarrassed about this are the people who owe you. That, that, that's the, the real part where, you know, that's the people who should worry, not the people who are rightly getting their just desserts. So what do we do about it then? How, how do you make that first step? Because for me, it's always about those first words that you say almost. Oh. It's about the very act of picking up the phone that I find the most difficult bit. You're so right. And I won't pretend that it's not something that's a bit trepidatious for me when I actually reach for the telephone. So I remind myself of this sort of first thing, this first idea is to know your worth. Recognise that the reason they have bought something from you or used your service is because other people either can't or don't provide that service and they needed it. And they were willing at the time to say yes we'll have that at your agreed terms so what on earth is the the problem now so there shouldn't be that natural reticence that awkwardness about as you say picking up the phone in the first instance because it's something that we should be able to do and i remember do you recall anne robinson from years oh, yes ago? yeah <laughs> You remember the weakest link on telly and prior to that, she was a Fleet Street columnist for years. A very scary woman. I would not not pay Anne. (laughs) Exactly. And she knew that and she used it to her own benefit. She's admitted she's never been coy about talking about money. When she went under one national Fleet Street editor, she demanded that her salary was doubled and she got it. And she demanded, I think it was a Mercedes car with a phone in it, I mean, different times, obviously, but she got that as well. And previously only senior executives would have had such a thing. But she said, look, I know I'm a decent columnist. I know they want me and I will go well on my way to becoming, as she did, the highest paid female journalist in Fleet Street. And she recognized it was her self-worth really that, that did that. And I recall my first radio station in the Midlands, Liz, long before we met on Five Live, I was was working at a long time long before. (laughs) And I was working there, and a new journalist joined us from another radio station in the Midlands, an established known journalist. 
And I remembered one day she'd gone through some difficulty or problem with the programme. And she said out loudly in the office, I don't put myself through all of this bother for a mere X many pounds a day. And my eyes widened. I went, how much? I said, but I get about half of that. And this woman, let's, let's call her Jenny. It wasn't Jenny, but let's call her Jenny. Said, well, that's what I uh, arrived at the station with. So I went to the boss and I was nervous, Liz, I have to confess. And he was a lovely boss as well. I went to the boss and I said, I've just found out what Jenny is being paid. And he said, yes. And I said, well, it's pretty much twice what I'm getting paid. He said, I know. I said, but is what comes out of the speaker for the two hours that Jenny is on air, twice the quality of what comes out the speaker when I'm on air for two hours? He said, no, it's the same. I said, well, I think I should be paid what Jenny's being paid then. He said, so do I. I went, well, and? He said, when would you like this to start? I said, straight away. And he went, okay. I mean, but, unbelievable that had but, I not asked, I would not have got, obviously. But did you assume when you went into that room that he'd say no? Yes, or, or at least he would fight me down or he'd go, well, maybe because Jenny was of higher quality, higher established, longer in the tooth, more experienced, all of those things. But I and also, think we always assume the worst. Yeah, yeah, and I, I kind of thought that it wouldn't go well for me and I shouldn't have thought that. And OK, I'm not pretending that is the, the typical experience of people when they're asking for their unpaid invoices. I'm, I know it's harder than that. But why assume the worst if you should, and this would be my second point really, assume the best. Imagine it's going to work well, not for some hippy dippy hoopla reason that if you think it's going to be good it will be, not for that reason, but just that you put yourself in the mindset that this is going to work for you and you don't have to start by getting stroppy. I know you may feel that way, you may want to threaten them with legal action and tell them that your kids are going to go without food tonight. I just don't think it helps really. It's to keep control, it's about being rational, not emotional, and to phone. I often, Liz, what I do is I couch my phone call in... I just wonder if you could help me through here. We've got this, it seems a mismatch between what we've asked for and what's been paid. Can I just check I've, I've understood this correctly? I pretend it's an inquiry. Really, it's a phone to moan. That's what it's for. But I just pretend it's an inquiry. And often when I get through, it's not usually to the person I need to speak to straight away. That's another reason not to be emotional. You're not getting through to the first person whose fault it is anyway. And if it's a big company, Typically, your invoice could be stuck between departments. That does happen. It could be because you yourself have left, I don't know, a tax date or an incorrectly signed document. I mean, how embarrassing is that that you go ranting at them and they go, we're perfectly willing to pay, but you will need to send us a revised invoice. And you go, oh, well, I will then. And all of the steam is taken out of your, of your sales. So yeah, I would assume the best and hope that it's going to happen, and often it will. But there are occasions when the children aren't going to get fed, and we know that because we get these kind of calls. Um, and I think probably the thing is not to leave it that long. Yes, if you can preempt this situation from arising in the first place, that would be ideal. And I know it means extra effort from your side. It means maybe a week in advance of the due date to phone and say, just checking you've got everything you need for, for this call. Is there anything I can do to, to help speed this through? That establishes a sort of rapport with the person you're talking to. And if you do get to speak to Mark from accounts a week prior, and then two weeks later, it's still delayed, you can phone and speak to Mark. And if you'd established that rapport and got on well and talked about the, I don't know, the match which the team you're interested in, you support, both of you happen to support, you, you make that connection and Mark will do all he can to do more for you as a result. So I do appreciate it's very often not a lighthearted issue. There are genuine funds that are desperately needed, but surely you're going to get a better result if you believe that it's going to be successful and speak to people civilly and rationally rather than emotionally.
taking all of that on board, um, it sounds to me as if the same rule applies as applies to any other type of communication. You need to have it planned out. Oh my goodness, yes. You need to have thought it through first. And particularly if you are an emotional, angry person, you might just reach for the phone and then start stabbing away at the numbers, demanding some sort of action. But if they were to come back to you and say, well, what invoice number is this you're talking about? You go, I don't know, we send out dozens of invoices. A week. It's not gonna help. You need to have the, the disputed invoice in front of you. I mean, it sounds obvious, but so many people seem to go in without these basic facts, some dates, some maybe previous points of contact, times of previous emails, what was said in previous emails. And you can go through this with a plan in your mind, which won't show you up. I'm not saying this just to save face, but obviously if you are viewed by the company concerned as a decent and honest individual who's organized and got all their ducks in a row, and that will reflect well upon your company too, then they are more likely to react in a way which will be favorable. I'll give you an example. Only last week, unbelievably big company phoned to tell us that we owed them money. Now, we were really convinced that we didn't, so we said as much. And they then phoned and said, well, it's this invoice that hasn't been paid. And we sent them details back and proof that indeed it had. They then said, well, it's probably another invoice that hadn't been paid. Could you go through your system and find out which one that might be? I was astonished to be asked this, but you know, we played ball. It took a bit of extra time. We provided them with a list of dates and invoices and proof of payment. They then came back, they're going, it's a phantom invoice. Perhaps if you attributed a previous invoice number to it and paid it anyway, we're going, uh, no, it doesn't work like that. Now, I know usually for our purposes of, you know, this week, talk money week, it's not like that. That isn't how it happens. But imagine that you were in the position of this big company and how poorly they appeared to us. You are unlikely to be taken seriously if you seem to be so haphazard with with what you're doing but then you're questioning to yourself do i actually want to work with these unprofessional people again and as you said right at the beginning know your worth because we're the talent that Absolutely. helps big businesses to deliver their success i love that phrase we are the talent it's part of knowing your worth and it's very easy to go through that sort of displacement activity isn't it where you think i'd rather do anything than have that initial phone call it could be as easy as my circumstance in the midlands of that radio station it might be that easy to get the money you are owed unlikely to be quite that simple but nonetheless it could be as as easy as that and i know some people will do anything rather than make that first phone call i know authors for example Liz Barkley. I know authors who've told me, in confidence, but to heck with that, they've never had a cleaner oven than when they are due to be writing a book. It's true, isn't it? Are you talking about me? <laughs> Might be, possibly, but it's true. You would do anything, even the ghastly process of cleaning an <laughs> oven, which nobody likes, rather than put a uh, set of keyboard. That, that's true. Well, it's, it? it's well seen that my, I'm not writing a book at the moment. <laughs> I remember one one piece on the back of one book I saw, I think it was Chris Moyles, Radio 1 presenter, he wrote a second book and Jimmy Carr wrote, wrote as part of the blurb on the back, this is the book that Chris's publishers have been waiting for and the obvious hint there was he was way over deadline and that's the problem we need to leave things till it's too late also if you do that you give the impression to the company that you are willing to wait a while before you are paid and you don't want to give that impression so i would suggest know your worth i'd suggest assume the best and i suggest always have a plan eric it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you again uh, after as you said all of these years but thank you very much for contributing to talk money week and if you ever decide to wind up your own company uh -huh. you can probably come and help us um fine, talk fine. to small businesses at the office of the small business commissioner how, how promptly do you pay <laughs> very <Excellent. laughs> you'll yeah, find I mean... out when you send your invoice <laughs> sign me up <laughs> thank you eric thank you liz talk money week the 6th to the 10th of November. Talk about that money. Talk about it now. Have a plan. Know your worth and do not delay. Get those, get chasing those invoices now.